Good afternoon and welcome to uh, Future of the City, uh, part two. We, we, we like, you know, extreme weather here at Future of the City, so having brought you the snowstorm for part one, we now bring you, you know, the apocalypse heat version for part two. Um, it's so great to have um, such a big crowd here today, and not just the size, they're just such fabulous people uh, in this room, and it's really an honor for us at the university um, to, to, to have you all as our, um, not just guests, but partners uh, in this conversation today. Um, I have a great job today, because uh, I get to um, talk with you uh, with Wendell Pierce and David Simon um, here, you know, in daylight, not on a Sunday night where most of you have been used to uh, being with them for some years now. Uh, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through introductions because <clears throat> the proverbial um, people who need no introduction, and if they did, it's in your program already. But just to say that when we started talking about doing this conference and focusing on arts and culture, um, we quickly asked the question, you know, who, who would we bring um, who would really represent, um, you know, the practitioner space uh, in thinking about art and culture as it uh, relates to cities? And um, within a nanosecond, the answer uh, was, um, were the names of these two gentlemen. So we are just so honored to have Wendell and David um, with us here today. And if you could please join me in welcoming them. So we have lots and lots to talk about today and a little less than an hour to do it and I am going to leave time for your questions at the end. Um, but I wanted to start, both, uh, uh, Wendell was with a group of us at dinner last night um, and he said something in conversation that uh, uh, David referenced in a conversation I had with him this morning and you both use the term Greek tragedy. Um, to talk about how you have framed this work on The Wire and Treme, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that, um, each of you. Uh, well, my reference was uh, the fact that the Greeks actually um, understood the value of culture and how it was a tangible craft. It's not something that's just reflective. I personally believe that uh, Art and culture is to the society as a whole what thoughts are to the individual. It's uh, the forum where you think of who you are, who you want to be, you deal with your strengths, your inadequacies, um, and you look forward. It is a, a tangible manifestation of how you are going to live your life. I'm a devotee of Albert Murray, um, an arts philosopher, uh, the Omni Americans, the blues people. Um, uh, we sit in his apartment in Harlem and uh, listen, most importantly, a good friend of Ralph Ellison. And, you know, it's the blues idiom uh, that is so American in the American aesthetic, which is, you know, it's not, I ain't got no shoes, but I ain't got no shoes and I'm still gonna walk to Chicago. It's uplifting, <laughs> you know, that, that's what it's about. You know, it's not just the down and out. It's the fact that the Greeks understood the role of culture in society, and we've lost that sense in America. We think of culture as some sort of piece of entertainment, some outside thing, where it's actually not just reflection, it's activism. It's actually tangible activism. And being a New Orleanian, uh, so much of our culture came out of that. Uh, I, as an actor, was inspired by Free Southern Theater, a group that came together during the Civil Rights Movement. It wasn't just plays, it was literally changing people's lives. The social aid and pleasure clubs of New Orleans came out of the necessity of uh, segregated South, where you couldn't get burial plots, you couldn't get insurance, you couldn't get health, uh, access to health care. So you pooled your money in these social aid and pleasure clubs. We understand the pleasure part. Social aid, that social network to say, if your daddy took sick, we got it. If your mama's dying and she goes away, we're going to send her off nice. Every part of our culture is practical. And that's what, the, that's what the Greeks understood. They came into the theater knowing the hubris that Oedipus is about to, to partake in and Medea's gonna go mad. They understood that. And it was a reminder, you know, you love your kids, you see what's happening, you know. 
Yeah, your old man reminds me of Jason. You better check it out. You know? <laughs> so uh, it was practical. That's the reason you go to the theater and turn off the lights and look at it. You reflect on who you are, and it's not just some sort of piece of entertainment. Yeah, catharsis. Um, the, the Greeks understood the power of tragedy. Uh, you know, you're not watching tragedy as a dramatic enterprise um, to, to, for the bathos of it. You're watching it uh, for what it does, what, it's, how it, what it says to you. Because life is essentially, uh, for everybody on a certain level, tragic. It has to be. Uh, we're mortals, and everybody we know and love is mortal. And, and everything we care about uh, is going to pass. So life is essentially tragic, and of course, most of what America seeks for entertainment is just, just, just distinctly avoids tragedy. We, 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 we want to segregate it, we want to put it into a, almost a psychic ghetto. I mean, 99% of what we use to distract ourselves is either spectacle or comedy. Um, and that's what sells, uh, that, that and porn. Um, so it, given all of that, you know, you look at what, you know, I think there's a real hunger that people don't actually feel, but when it's touched, when you, when you present them with something that's genuinely tragic and it's on a human scale, uh, they react because they've been hungry for it and they haven't known it. And I think people who are not from the theater tradition or, or who have not, who have supped heavily at, at, uh, at what passes for entertainment in this country, uh, they don't know what they're missing until, until it's right in front of them. And then it has considerable power. Um, what was that, the Thoreau comment about most men lead lives of quiet desperation? You know, the, the 21st century of that in this country, uh, it would be that most men lead lives of quiet masturbation. Because that's our culture. That's what, you know, we continually gratify ourselves with stories of affirmation and overcoming and and comedy, and boy meets girl, and boy finds the right girl, even though they were engaged to different people, and you know, and, and it all works out in the end, God damn it. But the truth is, is that we, we're living in a time of diminishing empire, um, and there is nothing in our political future that suggests that it's gonna be otherwise. And so we better reacquaint ourselves with the idea of, of tragedy, and, and the Greeks figured it out so long ago that you know, all, you had, all we had to do for The Wire was just go back and steal this stuff. Um, you know, we, we, it's not like you can literally go, oh, that was Medea. But the idea of, of faded individuals uh, and um, people who are no longer in control of their own destiny, um, that should be more and more resonant to Americans, not less. One of the things that I, that I know struck me, and I think, um, you know, was striking to a lot of people when uh, The Wire premiered is, um, one of my first reactions is, what took so long? And, which is to say, what took so long for, um, you know, filmmakers to find these corners of these places, by which I mean cities, and bring art and, cult and uh, expose them, you know, through an artist's lens? Um, I watched a lot of TV as a kid growing up, watched very little now, um, but it was television as you just described it, David. It was, you know, uh, sort of fantasy and adventure and, you know, Mr. Ed and Bewitched and Gunsmoke and I don't remember. Now you're talking the classics. I don't. <laughs> so that was the good stuff and then there was everything else. But I don't remember. I really can't think back to, there was this little thing, you know, Bridget and Bernie, I'm not sure if people remember that, and that had a slightly weird urban edge, and then quite some time before we had All in the Family. What took filmmakers so long to discover cities? Um, well, what happened was, there, in television's infancy, infancy there, I think there was the briefest suggestion that it might be a grown-up medium. You know, if you look back at like Playhouse 90, yes. where they were given, they were, they were really, they were about to give some small portion of it over to adult drama. Uh, and then what happened was, they found out there was a lot of money in it. And the money was constructed in such a way that you needed to bring the maximum number of eyeballs. You know, you could not have a rating share under 25% when there were only three networks and not be a failure. Um, 
And if that's the case, if, there has to, if, if you need to bring the maximum number of viewers in order to appease the advertisers and to be able to charge advertisers the highest rate possible, then you're going to have to, you know, then television is going to become very juvenile very quickly. And, re and it remained a juvenile medium, I think, for a very long period of time. And I think the only thing that's allowed grown-up work uh, in, lar in large amounts, I think what you're seeing in premium cable, is they got rid of the advertisers. The, the medium changed. Uh, in, in the same way that people this morning were discussing what the internet has done for art and for community, uh, some things I think, po certainly positively, is that democratized uh, the creation of art and then the distribution of art. It's also, I think, brutalized uh, the idea of copyright and the value of art, the value of artists. It's, it's, it's a ruthless diminishment there, but, but it is this revolution. Well, the revolution in television was 70 channels, 80 channels, 300 channels, and no advertising. You don't pay, you know, it's not the free box in your room, you know, and we just want to get the maximum number of advertisers to get their ad, ad in front of your eyes. No, no, no. We're, not, we're going to charge you for the actual content. So the content, therefore, can be idiosyncratic, and it can be across 300 channels. You know, we didn't have a lot of people watching The Wire. We don't have a lot of people watching Treme. Eventually, through various platforms, you know, some number of millions will find it. But if you look at our raw numbers, our Sunday night numbers, we're a disastrous failure by, standard, by the old standards of TV. So what, da what David has done is, when you look at what artists are trying to do, most revolutionary art, you don't try to find the common denominator. Right. You, you speak to, you challenge your audience. You, you speak to the most intelligent. You, you, you try to challenge um, you know, the most mature ideas. And so what happens is you have a lot of people who are coming to the wire late because they made certain assumptions when they just saw certain images. Right. Like someone said today, um, said, oh man, that's just the stereotypical image of young black male in urban America. I know where that's going. And then they took the time to find out that we weren't going to give you just the stock characters that you're going to get in the 48 minutes of a one hour show, 12 left for advertisers on regular television and that David was trying to say something about the dysfunction of the American urban uh, uh, society and saying something that most people hadn't seen in a while. And so what happened was he found the humanity in writing of the characters and the stories that you'll never pass a corner boy again after looking at the wire and seeing the depth and the multitude of dimension to these people's lives. I dare say that the fourth season of the wire, the investigation of uh, American schools and public schools in the city was one, some of the best television ever, some of the best art ever. And, and, you, and you actually see the tangible, cathartic moment of seeing where, you, where we lose children, where one goes down one road or one goes down the other, and the choices that, uh, that adults make to further that along. It says something about us as a society that that's not a given that we want to educate and give access to everyone. It really says a real ugly thing about our human nature uh, that has developed in this country that we don't automatically value children's education and the education of that. And to put it in an art form and to see it makes it tangible. It reminds me of how art is, an, is, is activism. You know, Justice Black had never seen genius in a black man until he was in a roadhouse in Texas and heard Louis Armstrong play. That had an effect when he got onto the Supreme Court, dealing with some of the decisions that he was gonna have to deal with. He had never seen genius in a black man and he saw this artist actually embody genius in, in an art form that speaks universally, especially in music, that touches something in our spirit. So that is why you never saw it on television. Television never wanted to deal with culture, the activism, the politicism that Ms. Lee was talking about, of culture, because that's what culture is. Uh, and that's what I'm learning in New Orleans. As much as I try to be diplomatic and say, well, listen, we're just gonna tell these stories, it's a political act, because when you, when, when you are, have lost your entire life, 
like we've lost our lives, our world in New Orleans. It was culture where people were speaking about it. I had an opportunity to do Waiting for Godot in the Lord Ninth Ward at our ground zero where so many people lost their lives, where Paul Chan, a visual artist I think from Chicago, said when he saw the Lord Ninth Ward, it reminded him of every production of Waiting for Godot he had ever seen. And so he started this project. And when we did it there, people came from all over, some people who had never been to the Lower Ninth Ward, from uptown New Orleans, the equivalent of coming from the folks, you know, in Evanston who have never been to the South Side, you know, <laughs> never been past the Loop, right? Uh, and they came together, and it was culture that brought them together, and it was that activism that made people realize that government was gonna, wasn't gonna be there for us, that it was gonna be on us. It was in spite of government that New Orleans is starting to recover. Because, you know, I, I, it, it, it's, it's, that sort of, it's that sort of rubber meeting the role that culture is. It is the place and the forum where we reflect on who we are. And then the true innovation comes, where you see what's needed, you see the problems, and then the last part, which is the most important, is implement something to change it. And that's what art does. And no, other, and, and no other aspect of our society does it in quite that way because it speaks to our humanity, not just the logistics and infrastructure of how we live our lives, actually who we are in our life. You know, one of the things that if, for people you know, who've been paying attention all morning uh, or even just listen to Wendell uh, right now is um, that, that's a lot of pressure on you all. So you have to make art that entertains, and that's hard enough, um, or provokes. Um, but you also have to now carry the burden of addressing you know, society's social ills, of being cathartic, therapeutic, helping Mayor Emanuel fix his, uh, you know, his budget, um, create jobs, be the economic engines for these incredible you know, and, and all the while not cities. A, not offend. Um, and offend or not, but that's a, that's a lot to do. And so John Freeman, in his um, excellent opening remarks this morning, said, you know, so I go to hear a Benjamin Britten composition, and I'm thinking, this is lovely. And I'm maybe not thinking, you know, what kind of jobs am I creating? You know, what, what's, what's this doing for economic development in London, et cetera? Do you all think about that? Do you actively, consciously think about that when you're working? Um, I, I'm, I'm in the entertainment industry by accident because the because journalism uh, collapsed, uh, newspaper journalism, and... and I heard. And, and, and <laughs> it's been going around. Um, this apparently is the, is the Tribune refugee table right here. <laughs> um, uh, um, I, I, I really, I got into it as, as an ab abstraction um, I didn't think I was going to stay into it. It's, it, you know, there were there were years where I was working in television and calling myself a journalist. Um, it's time to admit that you know I, I am part of the entertainment industry, but and I think Wendell will, will agree with me, especially after the experience of Treme, where it's so close to home for you because these are, this is the city you came up in. This is home. This is these are the people who who who, who you're going to see every day on the street who you know. Um, when I was a reporter, and when I was uh, writing books of narrative nonfiction, the greatest fear I had, and the only thing that is like always there on my shoulder as, 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 as just sheer terror, was that I was going to write something, and the people who knew the event were going to know that I was full of shit, that I didn't know it as well as I thought I knew it, that I, that I had not captured their world. So if, I'm, if I was writing a book about, or an article about, uh, a drug wiretap case. I didn't want the guys who were running the wiretap or the guys who were caught on the wiretap to read the story and not recognize the dynamic. When I was doing a, a, a book on a drug corner, I didn't want the 14-year-old the, the drug dealer, to, if, he, if he ever got hold of it, to read you know, chapter two and say, this guy doesn't know my world. And that's the only audience that I care about. And, and so, I mean, this sounds really uh, flippant, but it's true. I don't, 
you know, there's a lot of people out in, in, in LA in the entertainment industry, there's so much money in the entertainment industry that what they really want to do is they want to have a hit and they want to bring the most people in still. I mean, a network, they're still working by the old logic, which why wouldn't they? There's just so much money involved of, we just want to make the show more appealing. So if you like this character, give them more of that character. If they, if they don't like it, you know, you're, that's not drama. That's not somebody telling a story for the sake of the story. That's trying to sustain a franchise. And I've never had that in my head. The only thing I've had in my head doing all this stuff is, okay, we're doing a show about New Orleans. God, I do not want to run into these musicians and have them tell me the show is full of shit. And it's got to be doubly terrifying for you because oh, you're portraying. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I'm the guy behind the curtain with the little levers and stuff. He's he's, he's got, got the trombone. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, literally down down to down to the actual embouchure of your mouth and where the, where the slide is. And you know, there's 60 trombone players in that town ready to jump down your throat. When I walk into a club in New Orleans, they go, here comes the poser. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. From the stage, literally. But if, if, if that's the standard of, you know, one of the directors who did Generation Kill with us and then came to do Treme, uh, Simon. Simon. Yeah. He, uh, he said something to me that was absolutely true, which is, he said, you know, congratulations, you guys did Generation Kill for about 24 recon marines that were in Bravo platoon of first recon. That's who you did the show for. And now you're doing it for about 650 uh, professional musicians in New Orleans. So by that standard, you become a populist. Um, <laughs> but the, that's the truth, is that I don't really care what people out, I, I don't even think about the audience beyond the people living the event. I figure they'll take care of themselves or they won't. They'll come or they won't. But I just don't want to be ashamed in front of the people that I'm writing about. But, but the thing that's important to understand is, and, and I agree with David, is authenticity. All of you are artists. Truth, that's what it's always about for an artist. I want to make sure that I am telling something that is true to the human spirit, that this is authentic and organic, and it is not outside of that authenticity. Right. And that truth is the thing that makes it universal. The more specific you are, with your work, the more universal it becomes. While you may feel like it's only for those 650 musicians, it speaks to everyone because you're so, if, if the more specific you are, the more you will tap into that human thread that connects us all. That's the reason why uh, August Wilson can play in China. Right. That's because right. they understand, they understand Boy Willie's a legacy of his father yeah. and his mother and the family being broken apart by the, this country's original sin of slavery and understanding that that will speak to him for the rest of his life and if he doesn't go back and buy that land and be able to stand up right next to Sutter and talk about it, we will do nothing as a family, that I will dishonor them. There's a cat in Beijing who goes, I get it. It speaks to me. But it's real because of the specifics. Right. And, and what you have to do, I think, when you're addressing, listen, this doesn't work for all art. This is not a universal, but it does work for drama in that when you get specific, the authenticity is there for a reason. It's not to, to have a perfect one-on-one -on -one relationship with actuality. You know, we know where we cheat. In, uh, you have to cheat, drama being an artifice and, and, and and everything being uh, shorthand for real life. Real life, uh, you may have noticed, real life is decidedly undramatic at points. Um, and and you know, while, you can, while you can allude to that, you can't stay there if you're trying to create a drama. Um, but when you cheat, at least you know where you're cheating. You know, the vast majority of this stuff, if it's not specific, if it's just, you know, okay, uh, we're doing a medical drama, put medical stuff here. You know, eventually it starts to seep out and you not only you know, you're not only ashamed in front of the doctors and the nurses, you're ashamed in front of anybody who's looking for that human connection, for the, for the universality of it. You've, it becomes apparent how much you don't know and how much you don't care that you don't know. And that's, that's where the specific serves you. But if, you never have to think about the larger audience. They come anyway. And then it speaks or to all so, those other issues. You know? It speaks to all those other issues. Treme creates jobs in New Orleans. There's a cultural economy of New Orleans that's not even being tapped into. I was talking to the refugee table, and it said that there, there are three buildings in New Orleans. 
right now that I've known my entire life, sitting derelict, right, in the middle of parking lots in downtown New Orleans, which is the holy grail of jazz, the Odd Fellows Hall, where Louis Armstrong, would, as a little boy, would look in the door and see Kid Ori and hear Buddy Bolden and listen to Jelly Roll Morton and the grocery store that he worked in as a kid and this barbershop, which was the place where you went to the gathering of all these musicians where you could go and get them. They are on the National Register of Historic Places. But yet, not one administration in New Orleans trying to develop jobs, trying to attract uh, 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 the, the, that, that, that collection of um, young people that Dr. Massey was talking about earlier, have ever put any time, effort, and energy in developing those buildings, where it could actually be a mecca for people who come from all over the world to come to New Orleans and say, where's this birthplace of jazz that I see about? They sit abandoned and derelict. Abandoned and derelict. Congo Square should be like Calle Hamel in Havana, which every Sunday at 3 o'clock, they start the bimbes, and people come from around the world. I've been there, yes, I know I'm on the webcam. I've been to Havana. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, and, and, and you go, and I sat there in tears saying, the birthplace of jazz, where these captured Africans on Sunday will play that African six, hear the European brass played by their captors, combined and merged that gunk, 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 gunk with the oom pa pa of Europe, and it turned into oom pa oom pa boom, 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 American jazz, and yet it sits closed in New Orleans, and yet we have an administration that goes, how can we tap into jobs in this cultural administration? And all these Europeans walking around the hood going, why don't you have uh, a sign or music here? And, and, uh, and they get back on the bus and go home, you know? So if you take care of the authenticity, you create the jobs. You'll have the matrixes in all of your board meetings at all the foundations to go, yes, I understand that we had 3,000 <laughs> Europeans stop at Congo Square this week, you know? So you, all of that will take care of itself if you honor the authenticity of the work. It will, they will come. Well, they will come. There is one thing that didn't come up at the morning sessions that I kind of want to bring up, which is to say, um, one, of the, one of the dynamics that we're living through right now is the the diminution of labor, which is to say, uh, when, when, you know, since about the last three or four decades, certainly three decades, the, the prevailing philosophy of this country has been that uh, what's good for capital and what creates a profit and what the market will drive is good for society. We've mistaken the powerful engine that is capitalism and it is a powerful economic, it's, it's the only way to generate mass wealth in the modern world. But we've mistaken what is an economic engine for a social framework, which it is not and never has been. Uh, and, and the greatest societies, you've married that engine to a social framework, to the ideas, uh, to, to, to elements that, that demand a certain degree of social justice, a, so, a certain amount of, okay, we're not all going to make the same amount of money, some people are going to make more, but everybody is vested in this system. And what we're busy doing and have been doing for the last 30 years is we've been creating two separate Americas, one where a certain America is vested in the system, one where a certain America is not. And that's happening in Chicago, that's happening in New Orleans, it's happening in Baltimore, that's happening. It's happening to a variety of industries. You know, and to, to take it to the Treme point of view, um, it's a right to work state. And the 10th best piano player in New Orleans is probably the first best piano player in many major American cities, yet he is playing at a non-union wage, and not at a non-wage, he's playing for a tip jar at the front room of, of Bonton Roulet or on Frenchman Street, the spot and, 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 or spot cat, and barely making a living. When capital triumphs unequivocally, as opposed to being in a push-me-pull-me -me dynamic with labor, and I say this in the city of Haymarket and, and, and of broad shoulders and of the, of the, you know, essential to the labor movement in America, when labor is diminished, when capital triumphs unequivocally, labor is diminished, let's, don't, don't say it like labor is diminished, human beings are worth less. That's what The Wire was about. That's what Treme is implying. Until we have a restoration of the equilibrium between labor and, it, and its interests and the interests of capital, with neither one triumphing, 
and neither one uh, being defeated, until that begins to happen again, human beings are going to be worth less and less. Your children will be worth less and their children will be worth less. And you're seeing that in the last three decades. It, the, the chickens are coming home to roost. And that's what these shows have been about. And so what we're looking at, what feels right when we're doing Treme is we're doing a story about labor. It's, it's skilled labor. It's some of the greatest musicians and dance, second line dancers and, and artisans and chefs in the world. But by and large, they're all trapped in a situation in which while they're doing the hard work of bringing that city back, and it is them, it's, it's culture that's bringing that city back. Cult, nobody's thinking of it as a political act when they're doing it, they're doing it just because they got to do it. Because I got the saxo to play or I got this etouffee to cook. But, they're the people bringing New Orleans back. There is no other economic impetus for New Orleans now. There's no industrial base. There's no, you know, it's, it's that and, and the tourism that results from that. That is New Orleans now. And so these are the heroes of the piece, and there's not a dime to be had. One of the things um, uh, Howard Reich, the great Tribune critic, not a refugee, though, um, said, uh, writing about Treme recently, is that all, the, I mean, this verisimilitude, this fact, this specific, is really what um, animates uh, the work, and that without that it would be, um, uh, I think he said, you know, a great music video with some crisp dialogue, um, which seems um, completely uh, true. I wanted to sort of hook back to this, um, I don't want to dwell on journalism except as a springboard to talk about um, the impact uh, of, of the work. And so, David, I, I want to read you a, 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 something you said, which is always a horrible thing to replay people's quotes, but... I'll deny it now. Yeah, okay. The world now is almost inured to the power of journalism. The best journalism would manage to outrage people, and people are less and less inclined to outrage. I become increasingly cynical about the ability of daily journalism to affect any kind of meaningful change. I was pretty dubious about it when I was a journalist, but now I think it's remarkably ineffectual. What, what I want to know, and really this is um, for both of you, not just the former journalist, is um, so in what ways do you see this new form for you, um, an old form for you, Wendell, having impact? Is it outraging people? Are you seeing that? Are you? experiencing that with either The Wire or Treme? Where are you going? Oh. Go, you go. <laughs> <laughs> Suddenly he's shy. Uh, I think whatever Wendell thinks. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, there's a sense that those people that are being depicted uh, are having a voice that there are people in New Orleans who sit at these watch parties around the city and homes and all, who feel as though they are, um, their stories are being told, that they can have some impact, that that is uh, uh, journal journalistic in the fact that it's opening people's eyes that we are still here, we are still in, in, in dire straits, that uh, people have, um, uh, have have lost lost their way, um, but haven't lost who they are. Uh, so it has that impact. Uh, the, the impact of the wire that I've seen is um, it. I, I'll never forget. There was a moment. I don't know if David even knows this. That I I, I wanted to leave the wire, and it was uh, after that season. Uh, that fourth season, I had nothing to do with the kids, and I met the girl playing um, Zenobia, I think it was, who mm -hmm. slashes another oh, kid's yeah, face. Yeah. She came up, she said, Mr. Pierce, this wonderful young woman came up to me at the rap party and said, Mr. Pierce, I really admire your work. I wish that we would have had something to do together. I was like, you're on the wire? She says, yes, I play Zenobia. You know, and I was just like, you play Zenobia? She said, yes, she said, I'm graduating this year. You know, I'm going to Brown, I think she was going to, and I was like, why aren't we telling her story? Why aren't we telling her story? You know, that, the journalist and me, I wanted that to get. And I was like, man, maybe I'm contributing to the problem. Maybe it's, and then I saw the season, I realized that it wasn't arbitrary. That I'm falling victim to that idea that her, 
being this model student was only one worthy of her story being told. When actually the real journalism is that kid on the corner whose story is never told, who never gets his voice out. Um, and that's been the journalistic journey for me, uh, for The Wire and Treme, that people who haven't had their voices told, heard, are getting heard around the world in a way that some journalists have never tapped into. When I got into journalism, it was uh, the late 70s, and newspapers, at least the, the morning papers that had survived the, the shakeout, were ascendant. And the talk in journalism school was that newspapers were to be, to be, to, to, to survive and to, to stay relevant, they were going to become like magazines. The writing was going to have to be more sophisticated. Uh, people were going to have to cover beats in greater detail. We were going to become uh, real arbiters of nuanced discussions about society and politics and such, economics. And instead, the opposite started happening. It, uh, Watergate, the post-Watergate era, and then ultimately, the, there, there was sort of a, a dynamic by which everyone was looking for simple villains and simple heroes. And I, I realized I was not long for journalism when an editor came up to me and he said, in a, in a quote that we later used in The Wire, he said, why don't, why don't we tell the Dickensian stories of these young kids in the ghetto? And by that he meant like an eight-year-old waif who doesn't have a pencil or a notebook to go to school and he's malnourished and his mother is uh, trying, but she's, he, he wanted an innocent victim. Um, and the real truth is that that's easy. You know, if you can't make an eight-year-old with no opportunity into, into, into uh, a poster boy for, for sort of a fake level of empathy. Um, you, you know, you don't have any skills at all. The trick is, take a 13-year-old who's already working as a lookout on a drug corner, who only a few years earlier was that eight-year-old, and who now has done nothing but participate in the only economy left in his part of America. Everything else is gone. This is the only industry still hiring. West Baltimore or South Chicago. And see if you can make him human. That's that's the because because that's where we stop making people human. You know, it's like it's it's that thin line of, oh no, now I'm a little scared of that kid. Fuck him. Write him off. And we're writing off ten to ten we don't need ten to fifteen percent of our hum, uh, of our human beings in the United States of America. The economy has systematically written them off. And so I, it's like I, I lost faith in journalism because journalism started to have a formula by which um, we, we self-congratulated and we, we gave ourselves prizes and we, you know, the Baltimore Sun has learned that, you know, there are poor people in West Baltimore. And, but why that was, the why, you know, journalism was a, is a grown-up, it's a grown-up thing when you ask the why. Who, what, when, where, how? A smart 14-year-old can answer those questions. And right now, the why is the thing that requires well-paid staffs of people who want to do that job as a calling and who believe in the idea of trying to parse complicated things that have multiple arguments and often contradictory arguments. You know, to get people to do that job who can do the why means you have to really pay them and value them and you have to, you have to there has to be an economy of scale. You know, I really value a great newsroom. Um, even though I only, there were only a few years where I got to work in one. Um, but I, I became, that's where that quote comes from. I became increasingly disappointed in the ambitions of journalism. And can, can, can making film trade on, you know, can, it, can that become a surrogate? I don't think so. I don't think so because, first of all, it's too expensive. It takes $35, $40 million to make a season, uh, which is 10 hours of programming one of these shows. There's not a lot of guys dying to be Wendell Pierce and David Simon and go make The Wire out in Hollywood. You know, it's not, we've proven how to make a show that nobody seems to watch. Um, so, so there's not a lot of people behind us rushing in. And, and ultimately, you know, it can be dismissed as propaganda because that, it is, in a sense. It's, it's us making it, a, at best, it's an op-ed. You know, it's the equivalent <laughs> of, an, of an editorial. It's not, it's not fact-based. It is fact-based, but we're, we're choosing our facts, as any dramatist 
you know, has to. So I'm not sure that we can get there from here using it. Uh, I do know that it does speak to what I think I've learned of the world from being a reporter, and it's motivated by uh, impulses that are re uh, repertorial. But I'm not sure. I'm not sure we get there from here using this. I, I think it's its own. It is what it is for its own sake. And, and uh, let me let me answer. I'll, just one last thing. The one thing that you should have gotten from the wire is that the drug war is an unbelievable fraud, and it's the brutality of our underclass under the guise of, of a drug prohibition. I got that. Everybody who watched it, I think, understood that the drug war was had become a, a moral uh, thing. But the wire's been off the air three years. Nobody's making any noise about. It. I mean, they're still fighting over medical marijuana, you know. And, and and you look at this and you say, you know, we're now the jailingest country on the planet. We put more people in prison. I don't mean more per capita. I mean more bodies than China. Nobody puts more more a higher percentage of its population or more of its people in prison by sheer numbers than the United States of America. It's, it's devouring our own democracy. And by the way, less violent people than ever before. No, we are devouring our democracy. And yet, it's going to go on for another two, three, before we ever find even a single politician to risk his career to say what the truth is here. And so, you know, but let me just make one shill argument. I do it wherever I speak. If you're sitting on a jury and it happens to be a nonviolent drug offender, I don't care if he's got a pound of cocaine or an ounce of marijuana or what it is. If there's no violence involved, consider the idea that you have a moral obligation to nullify that jury if, if, you're, if you're a citizen of, of this country and if you believe in democracy. Because you know, what we're doing now is just venal. Um, but The Wire did that for five years, six, uh, 60 hours of television. It didn't land at all, so I guess there's your answer. Mm. Um, so, people, if you have questions, uh, put your hands up, and Michelle will be um, making the rounds. And while she's doing that, and while you're thinking about your questions, just really quickly, uh, each of you also have said to me in separate conversations, you talked about um, this work is being um, you used different words. One was therapeutic, one was cathartic. Wendell, you talked about these kind of viewing parties that take place in New Orleans. Um, where there is some incredible catharsis that's taking place for people around, you know, um, communally participating in or witnessing the art. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, for me, uh, I, I grew up in a place called Pontchartrain Park. It was a part of the deepest flooding of New Orleans uh, during the man-made disaster of the flooding of New Orleans almost six years ago. Uh, and uh, Pontchartrain Park is a unique neighborhood that was um, created in post-World War II. It was the only place in segregated New Orleans where my father, coming back from World War II, could purchase a home as a part of the uh, suburbia, uh, uh, the 1950s suburbia New Orleans. It was in response to uh, the only day where blacks in New Orleans could go to the park it was on Wednesdays, Negro Day. And AP Turo led a very successful civil rights movement where, uh, as a result, um, they put this separate but equal neighborhood of Pontchartrain Park aside, 200 acres to appease them Negroes. And, uh, and in the middle of it, uh, a golf course designed by Joseph Bartholomew, who designed most of the courses of New Orleans, um, but couldn't play on them because he was African American. So we took something that was ugly and we made it beautiful, I like to say. Uh, it was an incubator of talent. Dutch Morial, the first black mayor, Terrence Blanchard, Grammy Award winning musician, came out of that neighborhood. Our EPA administrator, Lisa Jackson, grew up with me in that neighborhood. It was totally destroyed. I say all of that because I went home and realized that if it wasn't for my generation, uh, who inherited this wonderful neighborhood, if we didn't bring it back, it wouldn't come back because our parents were in their 80s. And I couldn't understand why it wasn't coming back. 97% home ownership, why isn't it coming? No crime, why isn't it coming back? So I started this initiative to rebuild. Punch Train Park CDC, they always tell me never speak to funders and ask for money. I was like, well, they're funding, right? That's what we're supposed to do. Uh, that's what you asked him. I never understood that. You know, oh, Wendell, you know, as executive director, you usually just, you know, 
don't ask for the money. And I'm like, when do we ask for the money? <laughs> At what point do we ask for the money? Oh, we're going to write a letter. Oh, I got a microphone right now. <laughs> so all of you, uh, Punch Train Park Community Development Corporation. PunchTrainParkCDC.org. That's what I'm doing. That's in life. And then I'm doing Treme, where you watch people struggle to rebuild their lives uh, facing these enormous challenges. So it's art imitating life, life imitating art. It's the age old uh, union, un uh, uh, union of what culture is about. Uh, Albert Murray says that the intersection of life and people is culture. It's that intersection. And so you see it demonstrated in Treme, and I I'm going through it in my neighborhood with the community of residents who have taken it upon themselves to exercise their right of self-determination and rebuild their own neighborhood. And while we've put together 200 qualified families doing solar and geothermal homes, we still have a governor that says $750 million that came from the federal government to rebuild New Orleans, you can do it, but you just can't do it with new construction. Yes. Fuck Bobby Jindal, I'm sorry. Um, it's that simple, you know? Money, six years, people are waiting. I have a woman, 80 years old, been waiting three years in my program. We've been in the media portrayed as people waiting for a handout. Well, no. What happened to my family was depicted in Treme, art imitating life. My father paid all state for 50 years and got 400 bucks. That was his answer to Katrina. Because Katrina, for the insurance companies, was $10 a day, I mean $40 a day for 10 days, $20 per person, my mother and my father. So they got 400 bucks after 50 years of premiums. It's the biggest crime in the history in my, in my lifetime. No one knows about it. Yeah, that's the foreshore, the, the, that's that journalistic question. Going back to it, <laughs> somebody, somebody write about that shit, you know? Yeah. All right, excuse me, I, I, I'm on HBO, I curse a lot. That's, uh, that's, so, that's Creole for Wendell's upset. Yes, uh, so <laughs> it, 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 for me, David has given me a real gift for the last decade of my life, and I want to publicly thank you, David. I'm really serious. I'm Thank serious you. about that. I'm an actor. This is, a, this is a great news. It is, and and, and it, it is a rarity for you to actually do this sort of work as an artist, where you understand the role of art and culture in society, that it is not some passive thing. It is not reflective. It is action. And in New Orleans, we understand that. And doing Treme has motivated people. It keeps people um, galvanized to make sure that they meet those challenges day to day because it's not being written about. People have forgotten the story. Martin Luther King said, we're a 10 day nation. You have the consciousness of the nation and the world for about 10 days. <laughs> and that's it. We've exhausted our 10 days over these six years. Uh, but every time I see a report about Joplin, Missouri and Haiti and Japan. Alabama and Japan, I know what those people are gonna go through for the next couple of decades. It's that moment when we lose our parents and we go, oh, this is what my buddy was talking about. This is that club that I didn't want to join so soon. And you become and you understand how we are leaving people abandoned. That, uh, that you know, the, the dysfunction of institutions are throwing away that 15 to 20 to 25%. And what happens is, so middle class folks get thought, get caught up in that and in New Orleans they go, wait a minute, wait, oh, whoa, y'all treat me like I'm from the Lord Ninth Ward, I'm, I'm from Gentilly, what? You're not going to pay my insurance? It's going to take me 10 years to rebuild my house? You know, I can't get a job. Oh, so it's, it's that sort of thing that uh, the Forum of Treme has allowed people to express their frustrations, see that Four years ago I was there that I may have made a couple of steps forward, but um, that's, uh, that's been the, the, the impact of art in people's lives specifically. Mm, thank you. Um, so we had some questions. Over here. Over here. 
Tribune Refugee. Um, so there's this great moment in The Wire in the fourth, in the fifth season where uh, McNulty is confronting the journalist and they've both done these fabrications of the serial murderer and uh, um, the journalist fabricating his own stories. And uh, McNulty's trying to figure this out and he turns to him and says, uh, I don't really understand it because I'm not in your tribe. Uh, and that, that struck me as something that is a thread through the wire and I wonder if you would talk about th that idea of cities as you know, consisting of tribes that often don't come across one another and don't understand each other. And um, a lot of that series tried to understand those threads that unite them. Is that something that you think art can do? Is it important for it to do? Is it important for us to understand that? I mean, I think, I don't want to speak for all of art. I mean, you know, my sister was an abstract painter and um, art's a big term and it has a lot of different purposes. Um, when you're doing a drama and it's based in social realism, yes, part of what you're doing is trying to bring, it's a travelogue of a kind. And you're trying to let people walk in, beside people they might otherwise not be able to do. Um, I, I take particular satisfaction in when, when we're, we're working in a trope that everyone thinks they know, you know, 16-year-old drug dealer, homicide detective, uh, Marine, U.S. Marine. War. I mean, how many, how many war tropes are there? Um, what I loved about Generation Kill was we used actual dialogue, the actual dynamics of that. We used those. Were, I don't know if anyone knows. Those were all the real names of those of Bravo platoon, um, and it's what happened on the four weeks into Baghdad. And we didn't cheat it. We didn't. We didn't ratchet it up. We didn't give. We didn't blow more stuff up. We didn't have anybody be more heroic than they were. We didn't have anybody be more foolish than they were, more reckless. Uh, we didn't create a war crime that didn't happen. We didn't create a moment of heroism that didn't happen. It's all, if you go read the book, it'll be, that's, ex oh, that's chapter, th that's uh, episode three, episode four. At the end, what I wanted was for anybody who actually cares about what happened in Iraq and what it's like for people who, who served there, to have had that travel experience, or as close as they're going to get without actually going, uh, using film. It's not the same as travel. I, I admit its limitations, but I guess what I'm saying is um, I, I, I'm interested in what hasn't been uh, devoured by the entertainment industry and made into, into cliche. You know, I mean, when I was in the homicide unit, I felt like this is not what I thought it would be like, you know, based on all the police stories I'd ever seen when they let me into that unit for a year. And, and I remember thinking right after it, thank God. I actually have something to write about that's new as opposed to what I thought it was going to be. And I mean, at least we're approaching film in the same way or, 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 or long form fil uh, film. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think th there, is a, there is an element of understanding the other tribe. And I'm not really interested in, I mean, if you looked at the, you know, by the way, we did it the same with every tribe. What was funny was when we got to season five, there were certain journalists who jumped up and said, that's not fair. It's all fun and games when you were doing that with the police department or city hall or the school system. But wait, we're, we're the heroes of our own story, and, and these guys are not always heroic. But that, act, that story was actually bookended by a very good work of piece of journalism. And at the end, in the last episode, you saw a very good piece of journalism. And it was written by people, not just myself on staff, who, who have great affection for journalism. But it was also a critique of where journalism, modern journalism, and newspaper lost its way. And so it, we're never, it's not, you know, you, it's not expose, we're not trying to be mean spirited, but we are, we are, we are trying to like sort of walk fairly beside people and, and have that experience. And have just time. briefly, just briefly, I, I, I think I, I'm Go at on. liberty to say that David uh, also believes we all live in cities. Most of America lives in a city con contrary, contrary to, uh, you know, the Midwestern small town mythology of America. You mean uh, the real Americans, yes. where they live. <laughs> um, uh, 80%, Sorry, election year rhetoric. Sorry. Uh, uh, it, that most of America lives in cities, and I think with Baltimore and uh, uh, with The Wire and Treme, uh, what David and what we're trying to say is we have to figure out a way to live together. We have to figure, we have to figure it out because we're living here. So we have to figure it out. That's Another right. quick question, somebody? Yeah, hi. 
My name is um, Lynn Hughes, and I'm from Chicago. And I just, first I want to say thank you to this panel for touching the consciousness of this broader cultural community in, unless I'm mistaken in my understanding, you're not separating art and culture. There's a misnomer where people separate. They say art and then they say culture. But in my mind, it is all one and the same. It's just a different category. And so my understanding of what you're saying is, is that's what you're pointing out, and I thank you for that. And, and if that is not correct, uh, but if, and that's your opinion, could you make a point of pointing that out <laughs> to this community that art is not separate and culture is not separate? It is one and the same. Uh, I, I'm in agreement. I, I think sometimes, I went to Juilliard, and the one thing that I always remembered was that I, even at, from a small child, I just never understood why we couldn't uh, applaud at the end of a movement. <laughs> I, I was like, that, that was bad. That, that, what, what's the deal, you know? And, I, and that's when I started to realize that, and, and especially as I was at Juilliard, as an actor, but listening to all this great classical music, uh, classical music is swinging. You know, went to Marcellus told me, he said, man, this is soulful, man, check this out. Check out what he's doing with this. I was like, well, they don't act like it's soulful. You know, they're sitting on their <laughs> hands. And what's the, what's the problem? What I realize now that there is the actual function of art and culture, right? And then our presentation of it, you know? Our presentation of it gets confused with the actual function of art and culture. They think that, listen, uh, I live on North Lakeshore Drive, I take my limo down, I go into Symphony Hall, and I like it this way, I am being artistic, or I am being cultural. It's like, no, they, they are. <laughs> and your participation in it is, but your presentation of it has nothing to do with the craft, has nothing to do with the culture. And what happens is then they sit there uh, and assume that if they see it in some other element, they actually see culture happening. It's like people in New Orleans who, who, who live on St. Charles Avenue and have never seen, you know, never gone to an Indian practice. You know, Mardi Gras Indians on Sunday night in a bar room, you know, practicing their craft of how I'm gonna chant and how I'm gonna dance and how I'm gonna look outside. I, I know it can be a little dangerous, especially in some places, but, you know, they've never seen it and they assume, well, oh, that's that. That's, you know, that's not my opera. And they don't even realize that most of the cats were writing opera, you know, when they first presented it in La Scala, you know, tomatoes were thrown and people, they, they Pirandello wrote six characters in search of an author and they chased him out of town, Great you point. know. And now we see it at Lincoln Center Theater like this. Like, mm. <laughs> And people get confused between the function of culture and the presentation of it, you know? And, and that's, that's what we get confused about. Funders listen to that because, you know, when you have those discussions about the matrix and quantifying and qualifying, understand that that is all just infrastructure to get you to the place, to get you to the theater, to concert hall. That's great, we need the money, we need the support, you know, but the actual work that's being done, you're supporting it. That discussion of the presentation of it is not the thing, it is not the essential thing of art and culture. We were, um, when we were in this room for lunch uh, some months ago for the opening of, 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 uh, of the this, this series of conferences, um, Ed Glazier from Harvard talked about um, the really special thing about cities being that they are, or the magic of cities really, that they are magnets for, um, he said, brilliant people who come to these places and then find connections and listening to um, David and Wendell, what a, what a splendid example um, of what Ed talked about. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it.